Hi, I'm Dr. Megan. Hi, Vicki. Um, I work in the Dr. Nichols Serotonin Laboratory at LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans, Louisiana, and we work with psychedelics. Psychoactive drug is one that affects the nervous system, um, the central nervous system, and it changes a person's perception of um, and mood, cognition, behavior, um, which includes psychedelics, but also all recreational drugs and all drugs of abuse and medicines like SSRIs and Ritalin and gabapentin and common use items like um, nicotine and caffeine and stuff. Classical psychedelics are like LSD um, and psilocybin and DMT, and they're all 5-HT2A receptor agonists. Um, so they interact with the serotonin system and do strange things to our brain by activating the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor. Well, psilocybin is grown in mushrooms, and not just the psilocybin cubensis, but a few others. Um, but uh, it's a 5-HT2A and 5-HT1A serotonin receptor agonist. And um, so like LSD, it's at, it interacts with a whole lot of different receptors. It's what pharmacologists call uh, promiscuous or dirty. Um, psilocybin is a prodrug, which means that it's actually, it actually has very low bioactivity on its own. Um, once it's absorbed into the circulatory system, it is almost immediately dephosphorylated and turned into psilocin which is the actual active form. And then the psilocin is the one that actually interacts with the 5-HT2A receptor. Homemade medicines or stuff that's extracted, actually anything that's not regulated by some kind of oversight like the FDA um, is going to have the same kind of issues, which are purity and potency. Like the psilocybin mushrooms, if you grow them at your house or someone else grows them, they might have a parasitic fungus on them that could make you sick. So um, aside from the purity, there's always potency issues. So the amounts of drug in homemade stuff can vary wildly from batch to batch. So, but like when you're using pharmaceutical grade drugs that are meeting FDA um, chemical purity standards, there's going to have um, a set amount of drug per dose. And FDA decides what, how much is just required for each specific kind of drug. And uh, there won't be any kind of contaminants in there. So consistent purity and potency from batch to batch without residual compounds. The current understanding um, is that psychedelics precipitate a temporary window of neuronal plasticity where the neurons grow and new connections and other are made to other neurons and they strengthen existing connections between the neurons. So whatever you do during that time, that window of plasticity. You kind of get either, you can learn new things or you can get better at what you're already doing. And then when the growth period is done in like, we believe maybe a week or two, these unused connections are allowed to atrophy. It doesn't look right now like there's like a, uh, any kind of permanent neural growth, but there's temporary neural growth. And then the neurons that are used during that time become much more efficient, have higher function. Psychedelics, especially psilocybin and to some extent ayahuasca, which means DMT, have been shown to have pretty long lasting antidepressant effects. Um, and also they've shown similar effects in animal models and certain behaviors uh, like passive coping are very comparable to human behaviors who are experiencing depression. So say if we do a forced swim test, which is where we take a rat and we throw it in a bucket of water and the rat just floats and waits to either drown or be saved. That's a passive coping strategy in an inescapable stressor. Um, an active coping strategy would be for the rat to try and get out, even if it knows it can't, to just keep trying. So um, psychedelics like LSD and DMT and psilocybin have been shown to increase active coping strategies in animal models. So not a whole lot is actively known 
about the effects of psychedelics on bipolar disorder. People with bipolar disorder who are on lithium are at a much higher risk of having seizures if they take psychedelics. So the effects of psychedelics on borderline personality disorder are iffy also. Um, so there are case studies of psychedelic assisted therapy relieving major depressive episodes in people with borderline personality disorder. But there's no publications in which psychedelics were used to treat the original disorder. It's highly conflated with complex uh, PTSD. So it's kind of hard to say what exactly is going on there and how psychedelics might help. Psychedelics probably will help PTSD though. So there's a chance that these anecdotes about people with borderline personality disorder who got helped by psychedelics might actually just had severe PTSD that, and not actually the, were born with this vulnerability to, to stressors that people with BPD have. Psychedelics and psychosis, they get a bad rap. So for a long time, they were considered um, psychomimetics. So they were mimicking psychosis. But if you actually look at uh, like a psych what a psychotic episode is like and compare it to what a psychedelic episode is like, they are vastly different. They are not at all alike. Psychedelics are not stand-ins for psychosis at all. So psychotic breaks can be caused by a number of different things like manic episodes, extended psychostimulant usage and subsequent sleep deprivation, age-related dementias, traumatic brain injuries, schizophrenia. And there's no evidence that classical psychedelics cause psychotic breaks in people who are not already at risk of psychosis for some other reason. One of the other issues with clinical trials is that they're supposed to be double blind which is where neither the clinicians or the subjects participating in the study are aware of whether the subject is getting the control drug or placebo or the experimental drug. However, it's very easy for someone who's having a psychedelic experience to know which option they got, and it's called unmasking. And the problem with unmasking is one of expectation. This introduces credibility issues because the power of expectation, often called the placebo effect, can make you feel better. So if you think you took medicine that'll make you better, you are, will, are a lot more likely to report that you feel better. Of course, if you actually study the physiology of it, there's no difference, but you feel better <laughs> and vice versa. Like if you think you did not get medicine that helped you, you will not feel better. This is really important for the animal research because the animals do not have any expectation of their psychedelic experience. So when they have parallel behaviors to the clinical result, humans in the clinical results, we can say, yes, this is definitely valid physiological neurological process and not because these people felt like they needed to meet these expectations by saying they were less depressed. Whether or not the psychedelic experience is necessary to get the effects of psychedelic drugs, or at least the cognitive mental health benefits, um, that is the question of the ages for psychedelic researchers right now. The cognitive benefits don't seem to be coming from the psychedelic experience itself. Rather, the psychedelic experience is an indicator that sufficient dosage has been given to initiate the neurological process that's responsible for the mental health benefits. If we could find a drug that you could give a lot to and have the same kind of neurological response, but without the neurological response that <laughs> causes the, the psychedelic trip, then yes, you could have a non-psychedelic psychedelic. But I don't think that's really possible.